All right, well, I'm excited to be with you all this morning. Uh, We are going to be continuing in our series in the Gospel of John as the passage that you just heard. We're in John chapter 13, looking at the disciples' uh, feet be washed by Jesus. And uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. I'm sure you can tell by the stage set up with the table and chairs. Um, We're going to be doing something a little bit different in order to give you all a glimpse, a little bit of a taste of what all of our redemption communities and our men's and women's Bible studies are going to be doing this year. Because this year, what they're going to be doing is intentionally focusing in on the person of Jesus, using interactive content that a ministry called See Jesus has actually created. We at Redemption have a partnership with See Jesus, the ministry, not just at Redemption Tempe, but across all 10 Redemption congregations. We have a partnership with See Jesus, and we actually use See Jesus as our framework for spiritual formation at Redemption. And so I'm really excited this morning because we've got a guest with us uh, who flew in from out of town, and, and he's here with us. Uh, he works with See Jesus. He's a director for the ministry, and uh, his name is John Horry. And He is a friend of mine. He's a friend of the pastors here, but he actually functions more like a pastor to the pastors at Redemption. He's a guy that I deeply love. I respect him. He loves Jesus, and he really has a heart to help other people really see Jesus and fall more deeply in love with him. And so would you guys give a warm Redemption Tempe welcome to John Horry. Well, John, uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I realized this at the first service before the 9 a.m., but you guys got a whole lot of John going on today. Yeah, I'm a, here, John, John's <laughs> here, and we are in the Gospel of John, so it's going to be good. There's a whole lot of John this There's morning. There's a whole lot of Johns this morning. Hey, will you, uh, man, will you just tell us briefly a little bit more about See Jesus, since we have a partnership with you guys? Tell us a little bit more about the ministry. Sure, it'd be my pleasure. I, I, I am... So excited to be with you all. Uh, our ministry, See Jesus, kind of like see, look at Jesus, uh, has had this growing partnership with Redemption over the past five years, and we are a global discipling mission. Uh, we call it a mission because we are hopefully helping to carry out the mission that Jesus gave uh, to go and make disciples. And one of the ways that we help do that is we design discipleship tools and then we train people to use them in discipling others and training others to do likewise. And so that includes books and studies and interactive seminars. And uh, obviously, global, it's just happening in a variety of places all over the world, including Tempe. So uh, some of you may be familiar with Paul Miller. Uh, He's written a bunch of books we have used around here as content. He's uh, written a book called uh, Love Walked Among Us that we preached actually a series through that um, a few years ago. He's written a book called A Praying Life. Uh, this is, uh, Paul Miller is a part of this ministry writing a lot of this content. Yeah, uh, obviously I'm not Paul Miller, but uh, I, I, I do work for Paul Miller. And it's a pleasure. When Paul first got started with this particular ministry, he was at one of the lowest places in his life. And one of the things that he shares is that all he had at that point, he discovered is Jesus. And so one of the early board members just said, Paul, you should call this new ministry See Jesus because all you keep saying is, look at Jesus, look at Jesus, look at Jesus. And so our purpose uh, is to help the church see and reflect the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so obviously our focus is on Jesus, but if we use a a certain framework as a way of describing uh, the gospel, um, there's there's a, a great refocus upon the significance of the gospel, uh, and I think there's a there's a sometimes a, an assumption that if we just say the word, that everyone kind of understands what we mean. Mm. And so I think most people, when they hear the word gospel, automatically think of a message that's preached by a preacher up front about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which it is. But at See Jesus, we also want to look at the gospel and the various overlapping layers. And so um, we see the gospel at the heart of the gospel is a person, the person of Jesus. Obviously, Jesus uh, did a great work on the cross to die for sinners like you and me, that we might live eternally. 
And also there's a way of the gospel, in other words, a, a, a way of following Jesus in his footsteps. This diagram is uh, super helpful. We love it, actually. We, we ripped it off of See Jesus with their permission uh, at Redemption. We've, we've adopted it. Actually, uh, we've got it in our office, and it's on some of our content as far as uh, for a framework of spiritual for- formation and uh, different elements of the gospel. I think it's really important that we have the person, the work, and the way. And so we're using this at Redemption. But let me just ask you, what is the danger, especially because we're, we're drilling into the person of Jesus this year as a church? Sure. Um, today, as we come to John 13, we're really looking at encountering the person of Jesus. What is the danger uh, if we remove that center circle of the person of Jesus from this diagram and from the gospel? Sure. To, to put simply, if, if you take the heart out of the gospel, you take the person of Jesus out of the gospel, then uh, you get John Horry in college, which if you met me in college, I, I believed in the work of the gospel, uh, placed my faith in Jesus at a very early age. I wanted to go live like him in obedience, but I was just not a nice person. And so typically what happens is, is as I lo- lost focus of the person of Jesus, I not only lost a sense of, a, of me as a person, but also a sense of how to treat other people as image bearers, uh, in, you know, of God. And so while I believed the right things, tried to do the right things, I was just not really very loving at all. Hmm. Well, we wanted to put this uh, diagram up here because we've been using it at Redemption, but there's also another helpful diagram for what for you guys have on the J curve about what it looks like as we follow Jesus. If you want to if you want to pull that up. And, sure, uh, sure. So, so with Jesus at the heart of the gospel, obviously uh, the work of the gospel is his life, death, and resurrection that is sufficient for the payment of our sins. Uh, when we talk about the way, we're talking about what our ministry would call the J-curve. Uh, obviously, for obvious reasons here, uh, if you see the life of Jesus, it follows this shape moving from life to death the resurrection. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 retraces the literal life, death, and resurrection. And then in chapter 3 of Philippians, the Apostle Paul goes on to basically say at one point, if his life followed this pattern, what makes us think that our life as followers of Jesus would be any different? And so if we follow in his footsteps, we are not only united to his person, but in that he draws us into the shape of his story as he continues to bring life through death and resurrection. It's really helpful. And so our, our goal today, as we come to John 13 and look at this famous scene where Jesus washes the disciples' feet, our goal is that we want to slow down. And that's what John is so helpful with, with see Jesus slow down to really see the beauty of Jesus and encounter the person of Jesus today, that we want to encounter him today in our time together. And so because we've got an interactive dynamic up here, we're actually a few weeks ago, if you remember, Josh talked about the difference between a lecture hall and a living room. We're going to press into the living room today. We're going to be doing some interactive stuff with you all here in a few minutes. And so uh, we welcome that and we want you guys to participate. And so I'm going to pray and then John's going to take us into the passage here. Jesus, thanks for this time. Thanks that we get to gather as your people. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here and we need you. You you are the one that enables us to truly see Jesus. Give us eyes to see the beauty of Christ this morning. Pray that your spirit would speak through us in this time, speak through your word. Jesus, we want to have an encounter with you. And the invitation that you give us is that you want to wash us. And Jesus, we need to be washed today. Amen. Amen. Now, as we dive into this morning's passage, I wanted to just note a few things. Um, uh, There's a sense, as John recalls what happened at this particular moment, that he kind of sets the scene. And if you look at verse 3 in particular, uh, he says that Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. And so there's this sense that Jesus knows that he has all authority bestowed upon him in heaven and earth, given to him by his Father. He also knew that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. And so Jesus was fully aware 
that he had not only authority, but that he had been sent on a mission and that not only where he came from and where he was going, but he knew that this, as John says, was his hour. And so this was the moment that the Father's plan unfolded from the time of eternity past was coming to full culmination at this particular moment. And so Jesus is fully aware of the significance of the moment, but he's also aware of a couple of details about how this will unfold. And so if we back up into verse 2, we see that he was aware that the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. And so in verse 21, later on, you'll see in the passage that he was fully aware that this was going to happen. If we back up a little bit further, he was also fully aware uh, that his time in this world uh, was coming to an end and that he would depart from this world. In other words, he is going to die. So Jesus is not only aware of the, the, the uh, significance of this particular moment in all space, time, and history, but that this moment would be fulfilled through betrayal, suffering, and even death. And so, John, as, as we're looking at this passage, if you were Jesus, you knew that your God-given purpose was coming to the point of full culmination, and you knew that it was going to come through a path of suffering, betrayal, and death. What would you do next? Fight or flight. I'm taking a flight. I'm going to Sky <laughs> Harbor. I'm going southwest to Hawaii, man. I'm out. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'd probably do the same. I, I jump on a plane. I, I'm out of here. Or if I was feeling like just super honorary that day, maybe I'd put up a fight. But as we see in the passage in just a moment, that Jesus chooses not fight or flight, but he chooses a different path. And so uh, John says it beautifully he says it right here uh, that he loved them to the end. And so here at this moment, the time has come. It's going to be a time of pain and suffering that ultimately leads to glory. And so, but rather than take off or rather than put up a fight, Jesus chooses to love. And so we see that beginning to unfold. And so uh, the plan, we oftentimes think that the plan begins to unfold or the moment of, of kind of a inauguration happens at the cross, but it's actually starting right here at this very moment as we see in verse 4 and following. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to me uh, that John uh, is not only the wit eyewitness of this particular moment, but he's also the narrator. So as he records this moment from his mind's eye, from his memory, he begins to, it's, it's like as if he's a movie director. It's at this particular point in the story or in the movie that he's going to say, okay, we're, we're at 15 millimeters wide. We're, we're going wide angle. Now cue the music. And so there's this low, increasing volume of this ominous music. The moment is coming. You're at the wide angle, and John would say, okay, begin to zoom in slowly. And so you move from 15 millimeters to 50 to 135 and so on until so you're zooming in to a focus at this. And he says, slow the camera frame rate down. Go slow-mo. And as he does and gets to 600 millimeters, 800 millimeters, he hones in on this particular moment at the feet of the disciples. And so uh, John wants us to see something here. And so if he does, maybe it's a good thing that maybe we slow down and try to see it together this morning. Yeah, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take a few minutes, we're going to slow down, and we want you guys to interact with these two verses, verses four and five, okay? So with a few people around you, friends, family, whoever's around you, we want to take a few moments and specifically count how many moves, how many actions Jesus does here in these two verses. 
Do that now, and then we're going to come back, and we want you guys to, to tell us uh, what you guys see. All right, how many moves, how many actions do you see in these two verses? Seven, yes, you guys are good, seven. All right, so what, what does he do first? What's the first move? Rose, what's next? Laid, third, took a towel, fourth, tied it, fifth, board, sixth, Washed, and then seventh, wipes the towel. Good job, guys. <laughs> nice biblical number. Yeah. Seven movements. Now, isn't it interesting that, that earlier in the text, uh, John uses uh, three verses to describe kind of all of eternity past, like this is the moment. And then here he slows down and uses two entire verses to describe something that he could have easily just said, oh, yeah, and Jesus washed their feet. But he breaks up that moment into these seven slow, distinct movements. So uh, Jesus rises from supper. He lays aside the outer garment. He takes a towel. He ties it around his waist. He pours water into a basin. He begins to wash the disciples' feet. And then he wipes with that towel to dry them. There, there's a, a sense that we got to remember that when John is writing this, he's recalling from memories of his moment of eyewitnessing that probably happened maybe up to 50 years before, In other words, he might be in his 70s when he's beginning to record this from his memory. So for those of us who are old enough, try to, read, to think about things we remember 50 years ago, let alone for some of us, maybe even things we remember five days ago. And so typically, if we remember something significant, it's usually because it invokes some kind of strong emotion whether it's exuberance or pain or maybe awe. John is not only feeling a sense of awe, but he, it, it's so etched in his mind that potentially 50 years later, he's remembering it in great specific detail. Why? He's just captivated by Jesus. You know, in, in the ancient world, uh, there is no record, written record, Christian or non, about a foot washing except this one. Why? Because it was the menial work of slaves. It's just something that happened every day, and so you don't record it. 
And yet John was just so in awe of what his master was doing, the work of slaves, that he not only had it etched in his mind, but he had to share it. And so he remembered it as if it just happened yesterday. I think the the beautiful thing that we see in this passage about Jesus is that he wants to wash his disciples' feet. He, He desires to wash the disciples' feet, and he wants to wash your feet today. In the same way, with the same desire, with the same intentionality, Jesus wants to wash your feet. But when you hear that, what do you think Jesus' posture is towards you? I want you all to close your eyes for a moment and take a minute and with your eyes closed, I think having your eyes closed is important to help you imagine. If you were to imagine right now Jesus washing your feet, what look do you see on his face? You see a look that, uh, that he's inconvenienced, that he's bothered by you? You see a, a look of disgust. Is he disgusted by your feet? Or is he delighted? Do you see delight in his face? Do you see his eyes locked in attentively to you? You see a face of care and concern. You can open your eyes. I think what we see in this passage is that Jesus delights in being able to wash your feet. And it's important to realize that when Jesus washes you, he doesn't do it like a drive through car wash, right? Where it's Automatically, you get on the conveyor belt, and within 60 seconds, you're in and out, right? It's, you've been sprayed down, scrubbed, and dried, and it's not even done that well in a drive through car wash. Right? That's, that's not how Jesus washes you. What we see here is that he kneels down. He bends down to care for you, to tend to your need. Knowing what you need already, he wants to care for you and tend to your need. And this morning, that is wherever you're at, whatever you're feeling right now internally, whatever's going on in your life, the invitation that Jesus gives is to allow him to wash you. And this is important because I think for a lot of us, we can know, oh yeah, Jesus washed the disciples' feet back then. It's something that he did back in history, and it almost becomes this abstract thing that we simply just know about Jesus, but this passage is an invitation to encounter him personally, to personally encounter Jesus and experience his care for you. Because the truth is, we all need washing. We all need washing. And so as John continues to to lead us through this passage, we're going to see how Peter responds to his need of being washed. Sure. After Jesus finishes washing the disciples' feet, he comes up to Simon Peter, and and for some of you, the idea of Jesus washing your feet uh, brings you great joy, but maybe for some of us, we may feel like Peter. So Peter says to Jesus, uh, Lord, do you wash my feet? You're going to do this for me? Why are you doing this? And Jesus says, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And so Jesus says, you're you're not fully going to understand everything I'm doing at this very moment, but later on you will. And despite what Jesus says, Peter says to him in very Peter-like fashion, you shall never wash my feet. It's so Peter-like. It's not... Uh, maybe not today, Jesus. Or no, that's okay. It's, you will never wash my feet. And then Jesus answers him, if I do not wash you, you will have no share with me. Um, if Jesus is telling Peter, if I don't wash you, 
I have no share with you. Well, what's, what's he implying in a variety of ways? Yeah, I think he's Im implying the need because the, he's dirty, right? There, mm -hmm. There's something about Peter that needs to be, needs to be cleansed. Sure. And a, a, as we know, John, is he just simply referring to uh, feet that are covered with dust, uh, Middle, Middle Eastern dust all over? No. No, it's not just, not just the physical washing, but there's something deeper as far as the, the reality of sin yeah. and, and the deeper washing that doesn't just happen with water. Sure, sure. And so uh, Jesus is, is, is doing two things at, at the same time. He's showing not only a modeling servanthood as he washes the dust and doing the work of a slave of his disciples' feet, but as he's saying to Peter, you don't fully get what I'm doing. Later on, you will. And so what, what he's really telling Peter is, it's not just your feet that need washing, but it's so much more. And so every one of us has what the Bible calls sin. We do wrong in the eyes of God, and so we cannot have a share in life with him or in him because he has no sin. And so Jesus very clearly says, look, if I don't wash you, you cannot have a share in my life. And so he's, he's, he's not just talking about a washing with water, but he's really talking about a washing with his blood. In other words, through his death that will come, he's going to pay for the sins of those who least deserve it. And so there's this sense at the moment that Peter is not fully getting it, but regardless, there's a hesitation. Whatever he's understanding at that moment, Jesus is offering him something wonderful, and he kind of recoils. And so we got to kind of wonder, why does he do that? Yeah, I've always, I was, I've always thought it's strange. You know, Jesus is offering to uh, wash Peter, but yet you see Peter not just like, hey, maybe later, but what you're, what you're drawing out, John, is like, he's like, no, you'll never do it. And so a uh, question that we want you guys to talk back with your groups is why? Like, why do you think Peter objects to being washed by Jesus? And so take a couple minutes, pair back up with the people around you, talk about why you think Peter objects to being washed by Jesus, and then we'll come back and, and hear what you guys say.
I boasted, I just wanna flaunt them. Bought me a crib with a lake and a cake. Now I'm just kidding with the future look great. Came a long way from that studio. The struggle's still real, but I'm Gucci though. To a two bedroom, me and Mark cool and taking life in one night at a time. Yeah. Okay, let's bring it back in. Um, what did you guys say? Well, I'd love for uh, you guys to shout out here in a, in a moment. Uh, less than a sentence, please. So a word or phrase, because uh, John's actually going to be trying to, to write these things up here, what you guys uh, notice. So what would you guys say? Why, why does Peter object? Protecting reputation. Jesus. Good. Respect. Pride. Holds him in reverence. Because he can take care of himself. Confusion. Shame. Embarrassment. He must take care of himself. Yeah, hey, in the 9 a.m. too, someone said that. It's great. Yeah, stinky feet, right? It's gross. All right. <laughs> These are great answers. Good. That's funny that we have two stinky feet comments in both services, and it came toward the end. Someone was brave enough to go, maybe he just had stinky feet. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever had someone wash your feet, whether literally or, or maybe even like a retreat context, it's, it's pretty uncomfortable when someone, especially when they don't warn you, it's like, hey, we're going to wash feet. It's like, oh, no. Um, I, I think there's this sense uh, of uh, all of this happening at that moment, that there's some confusion on Peter's part. Uh, there's a sense of shame. I think there's a sense that this is something slaves do, and, and why are you doing it, and why are you doing it with me? And, and so uh, someone in the first service said, uh, shouted out, too close. So, you know, uh, we, we want, and maybe we pray, Jesus, I want you to be close to me. And Jesus goes, okay. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, wait, Jesus, personal space is a little, you know, it's like a little too close. Why? Because it's like, I want you close, but on my terms. Because there's parts of me or, or there, there's corners of the rooms of my heart uh, in, in, in the corners in the rooms where I want to show you the, the living room. I don't want to show you the bedroom. I don't want to show you other rooms and closets. Hmm. And so maybe there's some shame. Or on the opposite end, someone uh, did mention there, there, there's some pride. All right, I'm really uncomfortable with this Jesus. So I'll take care of him. I'll, I'll wash my own feet. Or in the, some senses later, maybe I'll wash my own soul. And so maybe for some of us, we have similar feelings. As the invitation is not just one that happened in the past, but as the invitation is extended to each of us today of Jesus saying, I'll wash your feet, I'll wash your soul, I'll wash the various rooms in your heart. Maybe we feel the same way. There's either sometimes shame or maybe a sense of self-sufficiency. The, uh, that diagram that you had up here earlier with the, the circles. Um, I think this diagram is really helpful for this passage because I think there's really three ways that you could work through this passage. Um, man, talk to us. I knew you were talking to me, uh, even in between services, and of just the, the outside in versus the inside out. I'd, lo I'd love for you to, to speak into that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a preacher, naturally... It, my tendency would be to say, okay, here's the application. Jesus washed Peter's feet, so we should do likewise. So let's start here, and let's, let's, let's follow his way. Let's follow his footsteps. Let's go serve other people, which is obviously part of the text. Go and do likewise. 
Uh, but there's a sense that if we're going to start at the heart of the gospel, then rather than, in a sense, move our way in towards Jesus by following his footsteps, believing in his work, and then discovering him, uh, what if we actually started at the center? We started first with encountering the person of Jesus at the heart of the gospel. The invitation is not just to the world, but it's to me. I come to know and believe him not only as this beautiful, amazing person, but this God who did a magnificent work on the cross. And when that happens, both at a personal level as well as an intellectual level, why would I not be compelled to go and do likewise? It's really good. And I think that's the heart of the gospel, right? As far as it it begins with uh, encountering Jesus. And from there, he transforms you. And we're able to actually follow the way of Jesus working inside out rather than the outside in. I think that's really helpful. Um, and so I think that this is where this diagram, why we showed it in the beginning, this diagram is really helpful um, to really get at uh, the person, work, and way of Jesus because it does. It may, helps us make sense of a passage like this as, a, as truly an invitation to encounter Jesus. I think one of the things that is so striking to me um, is in verse 9 of this passage, Once Peter begins to actually realize what Jesus is really saying and what Jesus wants to do, he goes from objection of, you'll never do this, Jesus, to, Jesus, please wash me. And don't just wash my feet, Jesus, but wash my hands and my head also. And so Jesus, uh, so Peter begins to see what Jesus is doing, and he, he goes from the objecting to say, you'll never do this to actually wash me, but wash all of me because I want to have a part in you. He knows, that he, he realizes what Jesus is saying and he wants Jesus to wash him. And the question that I have for you this morning is have you encountered Jesus washing you? And more specifically, where in your life do you need Jesus to wash you today? What I want you guys to do again is close your eyes. Close your eyes for the purpose of removing distractions. Where in your life do you need Jesus to wash you today? See, as I've been praying, preparing this, there's two areas that Jesus has continued to just say. The two areas that Jesus wants to wash for you today are your wounds and your stains. So your wounds are things that have happened in your life. They're a part of your story. They're the things that have happened in the past or presently. And maybe it's even things that have been done to you. I think some of you are here this morning with deep emotional wounds. You have emotional wounds in your life. And Jesus wants to wash those wounds today. I think for some of you, it's the loss of life recently, that there's someone who's close to you, a loved one who has passed away recently, and that has left you wounded emotionally. For some, it's your parent. One of your parents has passed away. It's a sibling who has passed away. Even for some of you, it's a, it's a child who has passed away. So you have wounds. Maybe if it's even outside of family, it could be a close friend or a coworker that you loved and cared for. There's also the emotional wound of broken relationships. That family relationship that's been broken and now there's isolation and ostracization in your family and and communication has been cut off and it has wounded you. Or the friend that betrayed you. Or in your marriage, there's brokenness and there's an emotional wound. Or the person that you were dating that you were head over heels for who broke up with you and had left you brokenhearted. 
Some of you are here today with emotional wounds. And the invitation that Jesus has for you is to let him wash your wounds. Because he is not the drive through car wash. But Jesus wants to kneel down to wash your wounds. He does it slowly, attentively. And he does it in order to be with you in the midst of the pain to be with you, and ultimately to care for you as he washes your wounds. The painful thing is, is that some wounds take a very, very long time to heal. And Jesus knows this. And he wants to tend to your wounds today. And the beautiful thing about Jesus that we see in this passage. The invitation that we see is that he wants to wash those wounds over and over and over again so that they can begin to actually heal. Because we know that for wounds, that an open wound that is festering, if it is not cleaned, it gets infected. And so Jesus wants to care for you where you're at in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the wound. The other area that Jesus wants to wash this morning are your stains. The the stains in your life, this is related to the sin in your life and your sin. This is the, the things that you've done. And now because you've done these things, you now feel like you have stains in your life. And I think for many of you today, It's the continuous struggle that you continue to struggle the very thing that you do not want to do, but you keep doing it. And so therefore you feel like you have stains. It's you continue to be deceptive and you continue to lie even though you don't want to. You continue to be selfish even though you don't want to. You continue for comfort or for escape to you continue to look at the thing you don't want to look at, to use the thing you don't want to use, and it's a continuous struggle, and so therefore, you feel like you have stains. And sometimes you feel like you have so many stains that maybe you shouldn't actually even be here. That's not true. That's That's not Jesus' invitation. Jesus wants you to come. But this is the place for you, even in the midst of your stains. See, there's the reality of when you put on a shirt, a white shirt, and you're about to head out of the house, and you realize there's a bunch of stains on it, sometimes you feel like, I can't leave the house because I've got all these stains. But Jesus' invitation to you this morning, regardless of how many stains there are, regardless of what the stain is in your life, His invitation is for you to be washed by him today. He wants to wash you. And the beautiful thing that we see in this passage is that Jesus washed his disciples' feet with water. But what we know is that when you get stains on your clothes, stains won't come out with just water. Water alone doesn't remove stains because you need something else to remove the stains. And the good news of Jesus is that he doesn't just wash you with water because he knows that you need something more. Jesus doesn't just wash you with water, but he washes you with his blood. He washes you with his blood, that it is his blood that cleanses you from all of your sin. His blood cleanses you and washes you so that you can be white as snow and stand before him as spotless because of his blood. And so the invitation in this passage is regardless of whatever the stains are in your life, whatever the wounds are that you're sitting in this sanctuary with today, the invitation is come to Jesus. He wants to wash you. He wants you to encounter him. And he'll do it the same way that he washes in this passage, slowly, attentively, carefully, gently, because he loves you. 
Jesus wants to wash you today. And as we come to a close this morning, this leads us into our time of communion. The beautiful thing about communion, the sacrament that we take every single Sunday, is that it represents the way in which we are clean. The way in which Jesus washes us is that he washes us through the body that he freely gave for us that's represented in the bread. That he washes us by his blood that is represented in the wine or the juice. And we are cleansed, we are made whole, and we are healed by his blood. And so before we respond in communion, if you weren't here last week, we're, we've uh, changed communion a bit. And so just a few details. We have communion stations up here in the front. And at your own time, I want, you to, I want you to press in and talk to Jesus. I want you to encounter Jesus. I want you to take your time. You don't have to rush up here to take communion. There's three songs after this. And you can take your time all through those three songs to walk up. There's a table with the bread, the elements, the wine and juice are up here. Please dip and do not sip. Do not drink out of the bowls, okay? Uh, just uh, That's a pro tip, but you can dip, don't sip. Um, also, we have the prepackaged ones still. If you feel more comfortable doing that, it's all up here. And so I want to invite you to Jesus, invite you to be washed by him and invite you to encounter him as we partake in communion together. And so, John, would you, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Lord Jesus, we uh, give you thanks that uh, this is not just something that you did in the past for the disciples, but because you live today as the risen Lord, uh, you do that for us today. And the invitation is the same. It's to come. And you're not afraid to get close. And so, Lord, we pray that as we come to the table, that in you, as we confess our faith in you, there is a, 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 a confidence we can have to come to the table, not in of ourselves, but a confidence in your love, a confidence in your grace, a confidence in the sufficiency of your payment for my sin, and that by faith that payment is received. And therefore I can be confident in you in that way. I pray there would also be a, a sense of, re, uh, of freedom, Lord, that we would come freely to the table. Lord Jesus, as we partake and remember what you did on the cross for us, that we would uh, once again taste of your goodness. And in doing so, that we would not only uh, have a greater sense of awe and love of you, but would in turn also be compelled to live for you and like you. So bless this time at the table as we commune with you. In Jesus' name, amen.